join us for the third part of our series on Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. In this episode, we talk about creating a bank like the ones you already know about. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host here, Anthony Faso. Anthony, how are you today? I'm doing good. Uh, looking forward to diving a little deeper into becoming your own banker. And I was preparing for this meeting. It's just amazing how many times I've read this book and then a couple things here that I know that you're going to talk about at the end just just really pop for me today. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that today. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm glad you said that because... I know you and I have both been reading this book for years, and every time I go back through it, it's always something else jumps jumps out at you. So just keep learning layer by layer. But uh, today what we're talking about is we're part three of our series of going through Becoming Your Own Banker, and uh, we're starting on page 19. Page 19, creating a bank like the one you already know about. Anthony, when you started reading this, what were uh, some of your first takeaways here? On this part, you know, it's like we're always looking to create a business. Mm -hmm. Right. And we and we, we like to watch like we like to follow what banks do, not what they say. And what stood out to me is and, uh, and even when when people read this, part of the time is that, well, you know what? I think I want to create their own bank. <laughs> right. But and really to do that, we need to create a bank is, is not is is not very easy. No, not at all. I mean, you, you have to raise millions of dollars of capital. You have to get uh, approval by the state, which isn't, which isn't easy. You need to create a building. You need to hire staff. Then, then you need to do marketing because right now you, you need people's deposits, which I know you're going to talk about. But how long would you say that this time could take? And you're like, hey, I want to start a bank until you open up your doors. Oh man, you got me guessing. Now I would also put in there on the front end of it is you got to study, or you got to study the banking business, right? You can't just jump into it. Is you're going to spend years studying and learning about it. Um, I'm going to guess ten years at least, bare minimum. I'm going to tell you, be honest. I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> so that's the right answer. But, yeah, it's the right answer. But it's. I think we can both agree it's going to take years. Absolutely. Before you open the doors. So ten years before you probably even turn a profit. I'm guessing. I don't know. You just stole my thunder, Cameron. Oh, I, I, was, I was just going to ask. You just done all these steps. You raise capital. You create the bank. You got a building. You got employees. You're marketing. How much money have they made so far? Zero. Zero. All, all outlay. Money going out. Money going out. Money going really, out. And, and part of it is, really, if you want to build true wealth, you can't have short-term focus. You, you, need to, you need to look at it. You, you, need, to, need, to, you need to play the long game. And I just want, I wanted to point that out here. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> You're welcome. That was good. That was good. So if we take a look at how banks kind of work on a community level. Now, this is going to be, the description I'm going to give you is going to be a visual one. And I know everybody's listening to the podcast, but this is what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine kind of three circles on a page, kind of left to right. One on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. If we're looking at how banks work on a community level, that far left circle, we're going to call that one the saver. And in the middle, we're going to call that the banker. And on the far right side, we're going to call that the borrower. Okay. So for a banking system to work is you got to have savers. Now, Anthony, what type, again, we're in the far left circle. What type of accounts do savers typically put their money into? Well, people who are saving money, they may, they may use a money market, a savings account, a checking account, but really, when you think who people who where they think they're saving, they're actually investing, and they their their quote unquote savings is going to be in their IRA, four hundred one k investment account. Absolutely, and so we've got all these, these these dollars that are put inside these accounts from the savers, and all those accounts reside at a bank or also a financial institution. Mm -hmm. So, what is a bank or financial institution? do with that money do they sit on dollars when they have them in their in their possession anthony don't they just save it in the vault and just wait for you to withdraw it 
Yeah, like Scrooge McDuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have a huge vault that they just keep mm-hmm. filling up every single day and they all go jump and dive and play around in money. They're no. looking... The, the moment they make that deposit, it's a liability of the bank. Absolutely. They need to put it to work and banks put it to work by, lo- by creating loans. Exactly. So we're in the middle. The, the bank is in the middle and they've got all these deposits in their possession. And so what they need to do is they need to turn around and go find borrowers. Right? And we're all borrowers, right? Everybody goes out there and they borrow money. Now, Anthony, what type of accounts or what type of reasons do people typically borrow money for? Man, uh, mortgages, uh, credit cards, student loans, car loans, business loans. Uh, home equity lines of credit, uh, leases, whether it's a car or equipment lease, building leases, uh, building loans, like for anything, you can just put a loan at the end. You know, <laughs> you know what's funny is, uh, is you and I have done plenty of seminars together and, and taught and, and done those things. And when you stand up there and I ask these same questions to people and I say, hey, where, where do people put their money when they're saving? It's usually crickets. Mm-hmm. Right? Very few people say anything. But when I ask the question, hey, what do we borrow money for? Man, the room <laughs> jumps alive. Everybody's money, yeah. business, credit yeah. cards, college, bang, bang. And I'm like, okay, at least they're awake now, right? So I always think that's funny, a little funny dynamic. But, right, so we've got this equation, saver, banker, borrower, right? And so when we look at this, one of the reasons that I love Nelson's book and that I typically recommend that every single client that I have reads this book is because what Nelson proves in this book is he proves that in this scenario, just the average American is sending 30 to 35 cents of every single dollar that they make to banks in the form of interest, Mm -hmm. right? And so you've got savers putting money in these accounts, banks turn around, they take money, they turn around, they lend it, and the money, that whole thing just starts over again, right? How How much money did the bank put into this scenario, Anthony? In the scenario you're talking about the loans, none. Yeah, none, right? Because what Nelson tells us in this book is he's saying, okay, listen, we're going to create a bank like the ones they already know about. And how banks create themselves is they go out there $20, $25 million, and what they actually do is they put their money on the side, right? And they don't lend it out. But what they do is then they open up the doors to the community, which is the savers and the borrowers, and then they start turning, right, or lending the community's money. When I found out about this scenario, it was maybe 11 years ago, Right, and when I realized this, is I had, a, I, I had money. I don't say, but I had money sitting on deposit with Wells Fargo, and I had two car loans with them. The same bank. The same bank, right? And so when I came across the, came across the, came when I came to the conclusion that all they were really doing was lending me my own money back and charging me an interest rate. Wait, wait. So, how much were you? How much were your car loans? Interest rate, approximately. Oh, easily. Let's call it five, five and a half percent. Okay. So, what were they paying you on, on your savings? Oh, 001 percent. Mm. Right. Pretty good deal. That's a pretty good business. Exactly. Right. And I wanted a piece of that when mm-hmm. I realized what was happening. Right. And so when I, when that came about, that was one of the first things that I did is I started to take over my car loans, and this is eleven years ago or so. Right. And so one of the questions that I ask people is when we look at this, if we're a saver, a banker, and a borrower, what I ask them is, which one are you? Right, Anthony? Are you a saver or are you a borrower? I would say just about if you really look at it and think about it, everybody or just about everybody is both. Absolutely, right? We're all both. And one of the ex- examples I always give is I talk about my sisters, right, just briefly is... I've got one, I hope they're not listening. I got one sister that right, saves money and then I got another sister that spends it like crazy. And so, um, but in reality, we're all the same, right? Is, is we've got one, well, we're all saving money in these different types of accounts and we're also borrowing money for these different instances over our lifetime. So, right, I hope that helps kind of paint the picture of how banks work on a community level. Well, let me just add, I don't know if you're going to get to it later. If not, I'm still in your thunder, so we're even... What I was like to phrase it, if you are both, don't you already have what it takes to create your own banking system, right? They've just never been l- learned how, and that's what Nelson is doing in this book, right? And we talk a little bit more about how banks work. It wouldn't be fair if we don't address the fractional 
fractional reserve banking. And in as what I'm going to put a link in the show notes to a more detailed information. Uh, but in essence, what it is that the banks are taking the, the deposits from the customers, all right, and then they're loaning it to borrowers. But they hold a fraction of their reserves of the bank's liabilities. Okay, and the bank's reserves are held in cash in the bank or as balances in the bank's account at the central bank. So in essence, what it's saying is they may have loans out there for say $10 million, but that doesn't mean that they have $10 million of cash backing it up. They only have a fraction of that. And so that amplifies when we're talking about how these banks are making money, when the fractional reserve banking for every dollar that you that you deposit in banks now what is it now seven or eight? Oh, I thought it was higher than that. Okay. Yeah. Then let's say ten. If you put in a dollar, the bank can turn around and loan out ten. What you if you stop and think about that, that is that that is pretty powerful. One thing we're doing is we're actually increasing the money supply. Oh, yeah. Right? And which is a whole big issue where we are creating inflation. It's the way the government can, in essence, create um, more money. And I know Nelson talks about here about ending the Fed and what it is that these reserve requirements are set by the central bank. So the central bank is partly the problem of telling people of how much they can hold in reserves. And economically, that is a big issue. And that's one thing that's creating these booms and busts is because what will happen when times are good, the banking business is phenomenal. You get $1 and you're loaning out 10, okay? But the opposite happens. When somebody takes out a dollar, that means that there's $10 less for them to loan out. And when more people start taking money out, they don't have the reserves in there to, uh, to, to pay everybody back for their deposits. That's what they call the, the, run, the running banks, which happened in the 20s. It even happened in the 80s. There was a run, it happened in Greece not too long ago. I mean, it came super close back in, in the last financial crisis, right? But fortunately, the, or unfortunately, the government is, is stepping in and printing more money to help out the banks, right? So the banks can be very fragile. They're doing great when times are good, but when times aren't doing good, that is, go that, that is going to backfire. And what you're going to see, we're talking a lot about the, a lot of, particularly in the next chapter, the similarities that banks have and what insurance companies have. We're going to more detail later. They're very, they're run very similar, but one thing, one huge difference is that banks can use finance, can use this fractional reserve banking, and insurance companies cannot. And that's one of the many reasons why these insurance companies are over 100 years old and have paid dividends during all those 100 years is because they're not using some of these um, derivatives and fractional reserve banking uh, banks like like typical banks are doing. Let me uh, let me jump in there if you could. Yeah. As you said something in there surprisingly that was really good. <laughs> you said one of the well it was it was kind of an odd statement but probably uh, all of it right. But. Yeah yeah but one of the things you mentioned the phrase you said is that banks are fragile, mm. right? Is rarely do you, you hear somebody kind of mention that banks are fragile. Right. And I was, as you were talking, I totally zoned out what you said after that. But then I started <laughs> thinking about kind of what he meant by that. And, and, and I, I don't know what you meant by that, but I was going to kind of tell you what my thoughts were after you said that. Is that all right? Yeah. My thought was that banks, he, he, he mentioned that banks are fragile is because when you look at the banking system and when banks become over leveraged, right? And he was talking about that ratio of which they send money out. When they become over leveraged, that means they're sending a whole bunch of money out. It doesn't matter, right? Or how should I, I should say this this way is that when, 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 when money is moving, right? Banks are lending money and the money's coming back to them. Interest rates don't matter, right? So it doesn't matter if interest rates are high or if interest rates are low. 
banks make money, right, in both scenarios. And so the, the point that I was making is I just forgot it, but it was going to be a good one. The point that I was making is that banks make interest in a high environment and a low environment. And the reason that they're fragile is because when, when banks, when clients or consumers stop paying money back to a bank, that's when everything falls apart. It's not when interest rates move. It's when yeah. that flow of money stops. Right, that's when you see things happening um, that are terrible for the banking industry. So if you go back, like he was talking about in his book, do you go back to the Bank of Midland on page nineteen? He gives the example, and he was saying that twenty six percent of the loans that that bank were non performing. Right, those non performing loans were being lent were being lent to board members. Those board members were turned around. How do you define non performing? Not being paid back. Okay. Right. So they the bank was lending out twenty six percent of the loans that they had on their on their books were not being paid back. That's a problem if you're a bank, right? It doesn't matter interest rates, could care less, but if you're not getting your, your, your principal paid back to you that you can then turn around and, and lend out again, that's a problem. And so, right, you can see in the conclusion that Nelson says in the story is what happened with the bank in Midland? They failed, mm -hmm. right? Jump forward, fast forward to 2008, when banks were lending, right, money just to anybody and everybody that was breathing, all that money was going to the real estate industry mainly, Right, and everything was fine when people were paying them back. But when people either chose not to pay them back, or they could pay, they stopped paying them back because they couldn't, that's when everything started to come crumbling down. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the idea of bank being fragile, I believe that's what you're referring to. And then if you compare that to the insurance companies that we're losing, uh, that we're using, is insurance companies sit on millions right of reserves mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars of reserve uh, just capital on hand and that's one of the functions that they use to kind of rate these agencies so um big big difference night and day between financial institutions of banks that are typically leveraged right and always kind of push that envelope to insurance companies that are just sitting on cash and are cash cows so just thought i'd add that well speaking of that you had some information about uh Bank of America, you had, a, you had a good example of their interest. I did. So one of the things that we look at is um, this is on this is online public information. You can you can, one of the reports that we use is called Bauer Reports, um, and you can run a Bauer report on any financial institution in the U.S., any bank in the U.S. You can get and you can find out what their deposits are. You can find out the loans that they made. You can find out how much money, how much interest they made on these loans. And so one of the pieces that we have here is uh, BauerFinancial.com, and we looked at Bank of America, and um, this is from 2017. Bank of America in 2017 made a total amount of loans of $900 billion. Wow, almost a trillion. <laughs> so they lent out $900 billion. Do you know how much money they made? A lot? $36.9 billion. Right, and if I'm reading these notes correctly, they paid out 2.1 billion dollars. So if we go back to your three circles here, yeah. or like you with uh, Wells Fargo, they're paying the saver how much? Two billion? Two point nine. Let's call it three billion. Let's say three billion. Yep. Right, and then they're they're taking those deposits and doing what? They're loaning it. They're as loans, and how much are how much is that three? They're paying out three billion, and how much are they collecting? They made three thirty six point nine billion dollars. Wow! Right, and and then here's and I know you already mentioned this, but let's hit this home. Of these deposits, I how much money? Uh, how much mo How much of Bank of America's money is is, is in this equation? Zero. Zero. They're using other people's money. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, cra it's just wow. crazy. A Anthony Faso, speechless. You heard it here, you heard it here <laughs> for the first time, folks. I know. Man, I know. That was amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, when we're, t when we're thinking about that and how banks work, so, right, when, when, when clients come to realize that, Mm -hmm. Right. When I came to that realization is one of the things is, listen, you're going to take part in this whole banking system, whether you like it or not. Right. If you do nothing about it, you're choosing to take part in Bank of America's banking system. Right. 
if you understand banking or now that you've learned about it, you have a choice to make. If you choose to create your own banking system, think about this is you're able to now recapture or capture, right? The amount of interest that you would have sent to banks over your lifetime. And that's interest on cars, interest on college expenses, interest on you name it, right? That's kind of the scenario. That's the decision that you have to make once you read Nelson's book is, hey, do I want to continue to take part in this system that's set up to siphon money off of me or take money away from me over my lifetime? Or what he does in the back end of his book is he sets up a strategy and says, listen, now let's redirect some of these payments. That's all you have to do, right? So that's the business that you and I are in are setting up systems to redirect money back to our clients instead of going to big banking systems and financial institutions. Yeah, it's really all about changing who who we're writing our checks to. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of Bank of America, it's a bank of uh, the FASO Family Bank. Yeah. We're going to talk about like co-generation. Oh, I'm happy to talk about co-generation. That's, yeah. that's my favorite part of this uh, section here. Okay, co-generation on page uh, 20 on the uh, the right side, kind of the middle of this page. Nelson kind of brings in the idea of co-generation, and what I what I just talked about was a really good introduction into it. Is because once you read this book, is this book is not telling you that you need to um, uh, forget it. Well, once you read this book, the book is highlighting the option opportunity that you have. Right? In cogeneration, what you want you to think about is the way that people, the way that clients create an income is through their earned income, right? Their job. Mm -hmm. So they go to work and they create income. What Nelson is talking about with this idea of cogeneration is he's talking about creating a business that goes right alongside the career or the industry that you're in that also is going to generate revenue over your lifetime. And that's the banking business, right? So the way that we typically will say this to clients is, Whatever industry you're in, you should be in that industry. If you're a realtor, let's be in real estate and we need to be in banking. If you're a dentist, let's be in uh, the, the dentist industry, dental industry, and let's be into banking. Right? Does that make sense, Anthony? Yeah. Good. And our, our pay, our even push a little farther is you're already in the banking business. Mm -hmm. you, you're just using somebody else's bank. That's a great idea. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. You should create your own bank. Yeah, well, I just said that like 12 seconds ago. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff, brother. All right. One example I was going to share was, uh, man, I see this all the time, right? And if you set aside, you know, the idea, of just set aside some of the con the bad connotations that people have with family lending. But one of the things I see all the time is I'll see kind of the baby boomer parents or even grandma and grandpa sitting. We probably touched on this before, but sitting on cash, mm -hmm. right? And then you'll see their grandkids or you'll see the adult kids go out and finance vehicles and pay five, six percent, right, on their cars. I mean, that right there is a great opportunity for somebody to come in. I mean, if I'm, if I'm 60, 65 years old and I see my grandkids or my adult kids financing vehicles and I've got the cash sitting around, that's an opportunity for me, right? If they're responsible and reliable, hands down, I'm making that loan any day of the week. And, you know, I think, yes, yeah, that, that that is important and you know some people always are concerned that the grandkids aren't going to pay it back right but again that's an opportunity to teach them about banking and financing and that they do need to pay it back if they're willing to pay back bank of america they should be willing to pay back the bank of grandma and grandpa and ideally we need to teach these principles so if we're doing this right we're going to end up creating a legacy for the next generation. With the legacy is not just dollars, it's also cents as in knowledge. And we need to, we need to teach them with a little bit. So when, when they get a lot, they're going, to, they're going to have the knowledge and experience to take care of it. Absolutely. So it's kind of the takeaway, right in closing, is uh, on page 20 in the bottom right. Right? What Nelson says, just to quote the book, it says, All the ingredients are already there in place. All you have to do is understand what is going on in such insurance plans and tap into the system. What I'm going to say to kind of wrap it up here is there's two pieces to really understand infinite banking or the private banking concept, Anthony, right? Number one is you got to understand banking and you got to understand how banks work. And then number two is if you understand how you can properly design an insurance policy, to be kind of a cash management tool 
is you've got some real opportunity. The problem is that very few people understand either one of those and even less people understand both aspects of that, right? And so that's what you and I have spent the last 10, 11 years kind of researching and, and figuring out how to utilize and put these things in conjunction and put a strategy together along with it. My favorite part of the book was that, or not the book or the section, is the co-generation. Mm -hmm. And he had that example of, of a company, of like a lumber company where they're cutting up the wood, they're going to have some scraps. Yeah. So with those scraps, that makes, uh, you can create energy by burning the, by burning the scraps. So these, these lumber uh, facilities also have these co-generation. You know, all they're doing is taking some of the scraps and some of the things that's already flowing through the business, but they're making better use of it. And I think you have the ability to do the same thing with your dollars. Well, instead of that cogeneration plant, your cogeneration plant is a banking system. By just taking some of this money and redirecting it can help you build wealth for you and your family. Absolutely. Well said. Thank you. And with this infinite banking concept, I know we're going through the, through the book. We highly encourage you to read and uh, to read your own. We will be having a link for you that you can order the book from uh, Amazon. And it, whether you've read the book already or just what is this IBC thing? I still don't fully understand it. Is it for you? Is it not? The only way to really tell is what we have is the ability to get on a 15 minute phone call with Cameron or I just just to kind of get get some ideas of, of of whether we can work together and if IBC is for you and then then we can point in uh, give you some tips for the next step we we'll also have links for that in the, the show notes as well any final comments no stay tuned next uh, next one what we're going to be talking about is um, kind of Nelson, he's talked about banks, right? In this section, we talked yeah. about banks and, and the ones that we already know. Now we're going to dive a little bit deeper so that we do have an understanding of these insurance policies, how to structure them, and the way that we can kind of utilize them for our cash management system, ways that we can put a whole bunch of money in there that uh, typically you can't do. So um, I'm excited. Me too. So on that note, go make it a fantastic day. Take care. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. Also, check out our website, InfiniteWealthConsultants.com, to find our podcast along with other additional resources.